Okay, I came across, you're gonna hear a bunch of random statistics or studies that I've heard about recently. They'll be connected, but just to kind of forewarn you, I'm, I found a bunch of things really interesting this week as I was tidying up my preparation. And um, so, um, I, I heard this. This is really interesting. Slot machines bring in more money in the United States than all of the film industry in the United States and the entire Major League Baseball Association. That's, think about the film industry. That, and I know they're striking right now and there's not, you know, there's nothing coming out of Hollywood right now, but think about the entire film industry and then think about the entire Major League Baseball. Brewers made the playoffs, people. This is exciting, okay? Lots of stuff going on with Major League Baseball. People, I mean, it's a, it's a money-making machine. Slot machines. Like, I just picture... I mean, I know there's big casinos and stuff, but for, for whatever reason, like, I picture, like, a little granny in a truck stop, you know, on a slot machine, and, you know, she used to have a cigarette hanging out of her mouth while she was working the slot machine. Now you can't do that because you can't smoke inside, but, like, that's just what I pictured, you know? And, I, and I'm like, it's, it feels, that feels so inconsequential to me. It's just like, you know, a few quarters here and there, five bucks here or there, 20 bucks here or there, or whatever else, and yet more money comes in from slot machines than the film industry and Major League Baseball combined. Um, here's the reason why. Slot machines are addicting. And because they're addicting, it feels like a handful of coins here and there, a handful of dollars here and there, a little bit of stuff here and there, but it's not because the power of all of those seemingly inconsequential moments adds up when there's addiction that's being added into the mix. And we're in this series talking about tech, and technology is the same way in our lives. It feels inconsequential. It feels like, you know, a couple of quarters here and there, five bucks here and there. I'm going to just kind of check out my news feed and see what's going on. I'm going to just, you know, uh, answer this email. I'm going to do this stuff. But, but what feels inconsequential, because it is also addictive, and our technology is designed to be addictive, it's designed by the makers of it to be addictive. It's actually taking a much more massive toll on our attention spans, on our physical, mental, and emotional health, and even our spiritual health than what we realize. And so we've been in this series where we're talking about um, how God has called us to live and what technology means. If you remember the first week we said, if you add it up right now, the average person, how much time they spend on their phone a day, will, it will equal 15 years of their life spent on their phone. 15 years, right? So it feels inconsequential. It's a little bit here, a little bit there, but it's way more consequential than actually, uh, than, what, than what it feels like. But the issue in all of this is we're not like, go back to the dark ages, technology is horrible. The point is not technology versus no technology. Should we have technology or should we not have technology? That's ridiculous. The question, it's not even a real question. Technology is here and it's here to stay and we're not gonna bury our heads in the sand. But the question is unintentional technology versus, te uh, versus intentional technology, where we examine our behaviors with technology. We look at the way that it's impacting our lives. We are wise about the way that we interact with technology. Um, that's the, those are the kind of people that we want to be. And fill in the blanks for yourself, because everybody's in a different spot. If you're, like, if you're the kind of person who's like, yeah, I don't even have a smartphone, or I have one because my kids made me get one, but like, I just leave it at home in my desk drawer because I know how to read a map and I don't need GPS to help me get someplace. It, like, if you're that kind of person, now we go, okay, great, so maybe the phone is not the issue for you, but maybe for you, it's the constant stream of the news media that we have on the background in our houses all the time, or constant noise from talk radio, and we're being bombarded by information. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reference the phone a lot, and I'm gonna reference screens a lot. You fill in the blank with whatever it is, because the bottom line is we're really distracted people. And we all know it. I mean, I feel like even five years ago when I talked about this, people didn't know it, and they're like, wait a second. You're telling me that I'm distracted right now? <laughs> like, it was a, a kind of a more new, and now it's like there's articles all over the place talking about, oh my gosh, we're distracting ourselves into oblivion, and we don't even, you know, we're like, we're just waking up to that fact. So you fill in the blank with whatever that looks like for you. Um, but we've been exploring how distraction can rob us in, uh, of our purpose, of the reason why we were created in three specific ways over the course of the last few weeks. And the first way that, that uh, technology, unexamined, unintentional tech, um, can, can rob us is, first of all, in communion with our creator. 
that we can be so busy and so distracted that we're not even able to engage with God the way that he created and designed us to engage with him. Um, it also has a potential to rob us from, uh, from connection in community and relationship with other people. We're, we're sometimes so connected to people halfway around the world that we don't even know. We know all about what's going on in their life but we don't even look at the person across the dinner table from us because our nose is in our screen or we're watching TV or we're doing something along those lines, right? So distraction has the potential to rob us of connection and relationships. And then the final way that it can rob us is in engagement with God's mission. That God has designed us, he has called us, he's placed us in the time and in the place in which we live and his intention is not just that we would receive the goodness of God, but that the goodness of God would be experienced in the world outside of us and around us through us, that we would be conduits of God's grace, not just receivers only, but conduits of the, uh, of the grace of God to the world around us. But we can end up missing out on that fact that God has an agenda for our lives and a purpose and a plan and a calling on our lives because we're so distracted by other things. Now, I realize even just saying engaging with the mission of God, we talk about this all the time as a church family. I feel like I'm saying it till I'm blue in the face. Like, we're just always banging that drum about God has an agenda for your life. He's called you to engage in his mission of redeeming all of humanity back to himself. And it can kind of feel like, enough already. Like, we, we get the picture. Like, we, you know, whatever. And I, here's, here's the deal. This reminds me of when I was a kid. I must have been in probably like kindergarten or first grade. And um, we were doing a manners unit, we're like, we were learning all the manners in class. So it was like, how to answer the phone properly, to not just go, yeah, or hello, you know, but I had to go, hello, O'Connors, this is Jeff speaking, you know, like, uh, that's the way that you need to do that. Nobody teaches kids that anymore. I just realized that. I called one of my kids the other day, and they're like, yeah, and I was like, <sighs> where's the manners unit uh, from when I was a kid? So we had this manners unit, and you're like, you know, you learn to put a napkin on your lap and then use that to pat your mouth instead of wiping your mouth on your sleeve and all this stuff. And as a culmination of that unit, we had a tea party with all of our moms. And our moms came into the classroom and we had to like open the doors for them and say please and thank you and use a napkin like civilized people. And when I got done with it and it was all over, I was riding home with my mom and apparently I said to my mom, oh, thank goodness we are done with manners. Like, you know, checked it off the list, like learned it, it's done. I don't need to be so angsty about that anymore. Let's just live our lives. Can we just live our lives? We have sleeves for a reason, you know? Like I'm just, and I think we can kind of be that way sometimes about things, themes we come back to over and over again within our walk of life, within our serving and following Jesus as we look at like engaging in the mission of God and it's sort of like, okay, like and we talked about that. I'm like, yeah. And we're gonna keep talking about it because we don't just talk about it and then put it on a shelf, but it's incredibly important. It's not just a responsibility, but it's an amazing privilege that God uses us to be his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece. That he would actually use us in that way should be mind-blowing to us, and so we'll come back to it over and over and over again. Um, there's a, a story about this, about Jesus having this laser-like focus on the mission of God. Um, uh, it's a story of Zacchaeus found in Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. And it says that as Jesus entered Jericho and was, uh, was Jesus entered Jericho, Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, we got to understand is tax collectors were despised. They were Jewish people living in a Jewish land, but they were under the rule the Jews were under the rule of a tyrannical Roman Empire that took their nation by force. And tax collectors were Jews who oppressed their own people. The Roman Empire would hire them and they would say, you are required to extract this much tax from your people. Anything, you don't get a salary, anything over and above what you are required to give to us you feel free to take it. And so they were most often liars and cheats and they would, they would get money from people that they didn't need to get. And so, and they were Jews. And so all the Jews were like, you are the worst. You are literally working for the people that I hate and then you're taking my money to make yourself wealthy. Nobody liked tax collectors, right? We just read that Zacchaeus is not only a tax collector, but he's a chief tax collector. So he's really good at being a scumbag. Um, he's worked his way up the scumbag ranks of being a tax collector. It says in verse three that he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, 
he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I love Jesus is walking through a crowd, busyness, all kinds of commotion all around him, and he is noticing people. Just think about that. There was a book, I didn't read it, but the title of it was really uh, compelling, and, uh, and I've noticed it. Okay, there was a book that was written a while back. It was called Three Mile an Hour God. This idea that God took up residence as a human being and then walked the earth at three miles an hour. That God in his slowness and in his noticing, Jesus walked at three miles per hour and paid attention to the people that were around him. And in this moment, he's singling out a specific person. There's a whole crowd of people. And he's singling out Zacchaeus. I love that he just invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house too. He's like, hey, come down. He didn't go like, let's go to a coffee shop together. He's like, I'm coming over to your house. Let's, like, if that happened to me, if I was Zacchaeus, I would be like calling my wife, my children frantically and being like, quick, clean the house. We got people coming over. Like, we don't keep our house ready to entertain people. I don't know anybody else feel that. Like, like, if you show up unannounced at my house, God have mercy on your soul because you are going to have to work through something when you come into our house, right? So Zacchaeus takes Jesus, shows up at his house. Listen, all the people, verse seven, saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is in this crowd of people, dozens and dozens, hundreds of people, to the point where Zacchaeus can't see him over the crowd and he has to climb a tree. And all these people have ideas about who Jesus is and what he should be doing and how he should be living his life, and how he should be engaging in God's mission. But Jesus knew who he was, he knew whose he was, and he knew who it was that he was called to reach and to serve, and he said it at the end there. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came for Zacchaeus that day. He was dialed in on what his purpose, on the way God's mission in the world around him, the way that he was supposed to engage in that mission, Jesus was dialed in on what that was supposed to be, crystal clear on what it was supposed to be. There's a, you know, Jesus didn't just live that himself. He expected, he calls us to live that. So there's another story um, that if you've been around church land for a while, you know this story. It's in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Um, It's called the story of the Good Samaritan. It says, on one occasion, An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Okay, so, so Jesus is getting tested. They were always doing this to him. And they asked him, what's the most important, like what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what's the most important command? And he answers it the way that in other places in scripture, Jesus answered it. Jesus was asked that question and he said the same thing. Well, he's quoting from the Old Testament, love the Lord your God, with, but he's quoting two laws from the Old Testament. There were hundreds of laws in the Old Testament. So Jesus had selected those two as the most important, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And then the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so this guy answers it the way that Jesus would have answered it. And so Jesus is like, well done, that is the correct answer. And then the guy goes, so the second part of that, love your neighbor as yourself, who is my neighbor? In other words, who am I required to love? Who out of all the people out there, people I like, people I don't like, people I agree with, people I don't agree with, am I supposed to be loving, right? Now pay attention to that. 
he asks the question, who is my neighbor? Who am I required to love, right? Listen to Jesus' response. He tells a story. He did this all the time. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now pause here, okay? So Jesus tells a story. The man asked, who is my neighbor? Who am I required to love? If the second command that I have to live by is love your neighbor as yourself, who's, who do I have to give that love to, right? And so Jesus tells a story. Now anytime Jesus tells a parable, almost always he is he tells a story in a way that gets people leaning in a certain direction where they think they know where the story's gonna go, and then he jolts them a different direction with the truth. Almost all the time, that's what he was doing when he told parables, which are stories with a point to them, with a meaning. And it's no different in this. He goes, there was a man, he was beaten up by robbers, he was, like, everything was taken from him, he was left for dead on the street. And then, a man passes by, and that man is a priest, a Jewish priest. Now, in the hierarchy of people, he's telling the story to Jewish people. In their hierarchy, a priest is like, they were the most, I mean, you, it was a very highly select group of people. It was only descendants of Aaron, the relative of Moses. That could be, you had to be in the bloodline of Aaron in order to be a priest in the Jewish faith. And they were the ones that were doing all the rituals and all the sacrifices, performing all the ceremonies in the temple. They were, they were the closest to God, right? And so when Jesus is telling this story, this guy's beat up, he's wounded, he's had everything stolen from him, but a priest shows up on the scene. And everybody in the crowd is thinking, okay, the priest is like close to God. He's gonna do what he needs to do, right? And then Jesus goes, but he actually swung across the road to the other side of the road to get away from the guy and went on his way. He goes, and then another man showed up, and this man was a Levite. Now, a Levite, priests were the ones in the temple doing all the sacrifices, all the actual rituals. Levites were probably the next tier, religiously speaking. So they were a whole tribe of people in the, in the Jewish culture, and you had to be in that family tribal unit to be a Levite. And the Levites are the ones that worked the temple. They did all the other duties to make sure that the temple had everything functioning the way that it needed to. So again, kind of like elite, spiritual people in their minds is what they're thinking. And so Jesus is like, the priest, and everyone's like, ooh, but the priest walks past. And now a Levite, which is still pretty impressive, and the Levite does the same thing. He crosses to the other side of the road, and he passes by without helping. And then he says in verse 33, but a Samaritan as he traveled. Now, Samaritans were despised by the Jewish people. They were considered half-breeds because they were half-Jewish, but they were, they also, they had Jewish blood in them, but they also had the blood of, of Gentiles, of non-Jewish people. They lived in the same area. They worshiped the same God, but they, did, they weren't allowed in the temple because they weren't purebred Jewish people, and so they, they couldn't worship in that way, so they worshiped in different ways, and the Jewish, it went both ways. Samaritans did not like the Jewish people. Jewish people did not like the Samaritans. So again, whereas priests and Levites in the, uh, Levites in the story the people would have been like, oh, okay. When they heard Samaritan, it would have made everyone go like, oh, are you kidding me, a Samaritan? I mean, if, if a priest and a Levite walk by this guy that's beaten up and had everything stolen, what's a Samaritan gonna do? Spin on him and kick him while he's down and then take the rest of his clothes and, you know, finish the job and kill him? Like, what's, you know, what's that gonna be? This is where everybody's mind would have been going. They, they loathe each other, right? But again, Jesus gets you leaning in a particular way and then pops you back in a different direction. And he says, a Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Then Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, do you notice Jesus changed the question? 
the man said, who is my neighbor? So I, I have to love my neighbor as myself. Who's my, who's my neighbor? Who qualifies to receive that love from me? And Jesus tells the story, and then he turns the question around, and he doesn't say, who is your neighbor? He says, what kind of neighbor are you? What kind of person are you? Who are you becoming in the way that you look at your neighbors? He flips it on its head. He says, it's not about who's worthy of our love, but it's about who are we becoming that we would extend the love of God. And the man says, it's the guy who helped him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And for us, it's not just Jesus with Zacchaeus. It's not just a parable. We're called to engage in the mission of God in the world around us. It's Jesus' intention for all of us, every single one of us. Now, if you're around church or you've been serving Jesus for any number of time, like you know this, you can finish the story, you can finish my points. It's like, well, yeah, we're supposed to do that. But we all know that the difference between knowing what we're supposed to do and actually doing it, and we can know a lot of things and not do them, right? And this isn't, I'm not like keeping shame. I'm like, just the reality of it is a lot of us, we're educated way beyond our level of obedience. We know a whole lot more about scripture and what we're supposed to do more than, than what we actually put into practice and what we do. And so, so if we look at this and we're like, we are called to engage in God's mission to redeem the world. And our conversation that technology might, unintentional technology might distract us from that. Well, how do we do that? How do we make sure that we don't just know we're supposed to engage in God's mission, but we actually do it? So there was a study that was done in the early 70s um, that I read about a long time ago that I thought was amazing. Um, sociologists wanted to know what, what makes people do the right thing and what keeps people from doing the right thing, okay? And so what they did is they went to Princeton Theological Seminary, and in a class that was actually talking about doing good in the world, that was talking about joining God in his mission to redeem the world, to love the world, to engage in the mission of God in the world around us, right? It was a class where they were studying that. They had devised this, this um, test that they were gonna do or this study, but none of the students knew that they were doing a study. And so what they did was they gathered all the students, they split them into three groups after class one day, and to all three of the groups, they said the same thing. You have the opportunity across campus or across town to deliver a talk on this parable of Jesus, the story of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10. You have, a, you have an opportunity, it's a part of your assignment, but you're gonna go, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna read this scripture and you're gonna teach on what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, the way that Jesus laid out in the story of the Good Samaritan. But they'd split them up into three different groups. And they told the next part, that the first part was the same for all the groups, the next part they, they said different things to each of the groups. The first group, they, uh, they told them that you are not in a hurry at all. It's like in, you have two hours before, that, before you're supposed to teach. So you can take your time to get across town to get to where, or across campus to get to where you need to be before you're gonna deliver this talk, okay? The second group of people that they had, they said, you're on time, but you can't dilly-dally. You can't waste any time because you, you have just enough time to make it there. Um, you don't need to rush, but, like, but don't go slow or else you won't make it in time to deliver this talk on the Good Samaritan. And then the third group of people, they said to them, you're late. I know we're just telling you this right now. We mixed something up. You're supposed to be there right now, and so you need to get there as quickly as you possibly can in order to deliver this teaching on the Good Samaritan. And then what they did with those three groups that nobody knew was happening they had staged it on the route that they knew that these people would be taking to get to the spot where they were delivering this talk. They had an actor who was, it was in a narrow path, like in an alley that they would have to take to get to this building that they were gonna deliver this talk. There was an actor who just like in the Good Samaritan and a scripture that they were going to teach on was laying down, beaten, mostly unconscious, clothes torn, bloody, right in the path of where they had to walk. And then they sat back and they monitored to see who would actually stop to help this poor guy who's beaten and bloodied and bruised and robbed from, just like in the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm like, I want to be a part of doing this to people sometime. <laughs> that just sounds like fun. <laughs> I don't want to be the person who's being tested. I want to be the person who's testing. That would be fun. Um, so, so here's what happened. Because they wanted to see what role hurry plays in our willingness to do good. And so for the first third of people that had no hurry, 
63% of them stopped and helped the person in some degree or another. Now, I'm like, 63, that seems kind of low. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, wait till you hear the other numbers, okay? So 63 is pretty good. They stopped, they helped. Literally, they had it laid out to where you, you had to, like in the store, you had to almost like skirt around the alley to get around this person or else you wouldn't be able to get by them, okay? 63% of this first group, not in a rush at all, stopped and helped the person. When you go to the middle group where they weren't in a rush, but they, they had to keep moving, the number dropped to 45% of those people stopped to help this man who, for everything they knew, was on his deathbed laying in an alley. 45% of them. When I got to the group who was in a hurry, they were rushing. What were they rushing to do? Teach about the Good Samaritan. But they were in a hurry to do it. 10% stopped. That's it. Nine out of every 10 of those people stepped over, scooted around the other person, and the people doing the experiment came to the conclusion that we think that our willingness to do good hinges on lots of really complex things. Do I have the skills? Do I have the know-how? Do I have the opportunity? All these things. Am I a good person? Like, am I kind? Do I pay attention to other people? Do I not pay attention? But from their study, they concluded actually one of the main factors on whether or not we will join God in doing his mission in the world around us is as simple as whether or not we're in a hurry. And I hear that and I'm like, that doesn't bode well for us right now in 2023, right? I mean, we're always in a hurry, aren't we? I mean, we've all got to-do lists that are bigger than what we can get done. We're always feeling like we're behind the eight ball and we're we're hurried in in the sense of like our schedules are full and we got places to go and things to do 100%. But it's also, isn't there just this all pervasive sense of hurry and busyness just because of the information that we're constantly receiving all the time? It's like we know about all these things that need to be happening and need to be done. We're constantly available to, like our technology makes us hurried and busy. Even if it's not actually adding to-dos, I might have the same amount of to-dos on my to-do list, but I feel more busy and I feel more hurried because all of my technology is making me available to everyone else's requests and demands of my time. Every notification ding on my phone, every email that's being requesting something of me, even every advertisement from a marketing company or a company that's, that's you know, vying for my attention on my phone or on whatever device I happen to be on, I, when, I'm, when I'm paying attention to those things, I'm available to all of those people and all of those entities and all those things and all their demands out there someplace, and then I'm busy and I'm hurried right here with what's in front of me. I just read another stat that blew my mind that, the average person today, in one day, will, will experience and be exposed to more advertisements in one day than a person 50 years ago would have experienced in an entire year. That is crazy. That right now today, one day, you and I, conscious or subconscious, we get bombarded with more advertisements than somebody would have gotten in an entire year 50 years ago. We cannot delude ourselves into thinking that that's not having some kind of an impact on our lives, on our minds, on our health. Uh, There's another study that even being in the same room as our phone, the impact that it has on us, they did a study um, on our our cognitive abilities, our our memory recall and our problem-solving functions, and they took a group of people and they put them in a room, and the first time they tested them, they tested them, there were no phones in the room, and there were phones, like, their phones were taken away, there was no phone in the room, they tested them. Then they tested them again with their phones in the room. The phones were turned off. They weren't even holding them. They were across the room on a shelf, and they were turned off, but they were in the room. And what they discovered is the same people that their cognitive ability, their problem-solving ability, their memory recall was diminished when their phone was in the room turned off. How crazy, it's basically like our phones are like this constant magical device that are going, Jeff, 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 Jeff. Like any of you have little kids or remember having little kids when they're like, mom, 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 mom. And I remember Carrie being like, like I'm, 
anxious and I don't even know why I'm anxious and then all of a sudden I like snap out of the zone that I'm in. I'm like, oh, it's because a child is just constantly talking to me and asking me things and saying my name over and over and over and over and over and over again, like how distracting that is. Our phones are that to us. They're way less cute and they're not as rewarding either, you know? Um, That's what our phones are doing to us. And so this continual partial fragmented attention is the new normal and what it's stirring up in us is back to our Good Samaritan test group of the the hurried people who walked past the mission of God not because they're bad people, it's just because they're busy and they're hurried and our technology is making us busy and hurried. Even when we're not busy and hurried, we feel busy and hurried. Anybody ever feel that? You're like, why am I feeling anxious? There's just literally nothing going on. It's my day off, or I'm, I have a nice evening at home relaxing, or whatever, and it's like there's still something inside of us that feels like I'm not accomplishing what I need to accomplish, or there's something going on that I'm missing, or I need to take care of this, or whatever it is. It's, it's the unintentional consequences of our technology, and again, we're not saying throw it out the window. That's ridiculous, but let's be wise about it. So it didn't even just start now. It's been building over time. Um, there, actually, with, in the mid-1800s, the telegraph was, was invented. And up until the telegraph was invented, you literally, any news that you got, it was just your local news. It was like, whatever was going on in your village, that's what you learned about. Like, I live in Port Edwards, a wonderfully quaint, and I feel like Port Edwards just got trapped in 1987 or 1992 or something like that. It reminds me of my childhood, and I love it. It's great living here. It's really fun. Everything feels super connected, right? But like back in the day before the telegraph was invented, you would literally, any news that you got, it was like your local news, which sometimes is just like gossip, which is the same as news today anyways, but, the, you know, whatever. It's like you would wake up, and it would be like, oh, did you hear about the butcher yesterday? He got really angry at one of his customers and lashed out at him, and, you know, it was not good for his business, and there were people there that saw it, and it wasn't good. Like, that would be the news. Or the news would be like, yeah, the guy a couple houses down, you know that he has a problem with alcohol, and, like, apparently last night he was on a bender, and it was like, it wasn't good, and, you know, whatever. Or, like, it's something that you have some sort of agency in it. And any news that you got from outside of your immediate circle was like, you would get news, and it would be like, England got a new king two months ago. And you just found out about it because... That's how long it took for a ship to sail with the news on the ship from England all the way over here, right? And that's the way that it was. And so the only news, the only information that you were getting was in news that in some way you could do something about it. You had agency. You might not do something about it, but you could. You knew the person that it's talking about. You know the issue that was being discussed because it directly impacted you. With the rise of the telegraph, when they ran the telegraphing cables across the Atlantic Ocean, it was like, immediately you could wake up and you'd be like, there was an assassination in Russia last night. And you're like, I'm a dairy farmer in Wisconsin. I don't know what to do about that, right? I mean, like, and all of a sudden, that is what began this onslaught of information. People call it the Victorian internet, was the, was the, the telegraph. And what's really interesting is the impact that the telegraph had on people's health they started noticing that there was actually side effects to this bombardment of information. Now, again, think about, we're talking about a telegraph. You had to like, in Morse code, tap out, thing. we're not talking about, for them it was an onslaught of information, but for us we'd be like, oh my gosh, it's so slow. Like, like right now we're having issues with our internet, our Wi-Fi, it's so slow, it's painful. I need to call the company, I won't say their name, but the company that we use and be like, look, I'm paying for higher speeds than what I'm getting. You need to come over here and make this right. Because I'm hearing it from my kids all the time, like, this video that I want to watch, I can't watch it. It's like, it keeps buffering, you know? Like, we're, they would be freaking out about the scale of information that we get now, but it's normal to us. But a telegraph was changing the way that people were, what their, what their mental health was. Listen, women reported during that time, a ling- now they, they differentiated the, the studies between men and women, it's probably sexist even when you listen to the terms that they're using, okay? I didn't write the studies. It was the 1800s. I, I'm not going to make excuses for it, but whatever. It is what it is, okay? So they said that women reported a lingering sense of never being at ease as a result of all this information flooding, that they were swamped with negative feelings, 
Anybody feel that social media with news feeds constantly around the clock that you are swamped with negative feelings or a lingering sense of never being at ease? They were diagnosed with what medical practitioners of the day called hysteria. There was no term for it. But as people started having mental breakdowns, that started to rise. Up until that point, that was a very odd occurrence. And with the rise of the telegraph, that started to increase for men Men suffered from, this is different, maybe these are more masculine terms that we're trying to say instead of hysteria, I don't know. Uh, but men suffered from what were called brain fevers, brain storms, and nervous exhaustions. So hysteria, brain fevers, nervous exhaustions, all because information was starting to pour in at a rate that was greater than what our minds could metabolize, what our minds could process and figure out what to do about it. And there's a quote from, from back in the day that said that users of this new information system, the telegraph, were kept in continual excitement without time for quiet and rest. A telegraph. Imagine what the supercomputers that we carry around in our pockets, dinging all the time and giving us dopamine hits and calling out for our, our attention. And Jeff, 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 Jeff. Imagine what that would do but we kind of are blind to it. And the problem is, in our attention economy, we don't realize that every little thing is vying for your attention because your attention is money, even things that we can't do anything about. And so we end up with all of this, rather than getting news that we have agency over, we end up being bombarded with all this stuff that's like, I it's such a distraction, it's such a burden, and I don't know how to process it, and we end up feeling hurried and busy all the time, and we miss the opportunities that are right in front of us. They're right in front of us. Neil Postman, who is a sociologist, kind of a philosopher, who wrote uh, decades ago, he wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, and he wrote about what he called LIAR. It stands for Low Info to Action Ratio. Low info to action ratio. In other words, you get lots of information coming in, but you don't act on hardly any of that information. And the higher that ratio gets, again, when we don't have as much information coming in, we're acting on a lot of the information that we're getting. There's a high ratio. But that low ratio is I'm being bombarded with everything that's going on around the world, everything I need to be outraged about, everything I need to be woke about, everything I need to be understanding and in, in, in the know about. Like, are you, get wise to what's going on here, people. Don't you see what they're doing? Like, that rises and rises and rises, but our action doesn't move. I read another study, this blows my mind, that our brains, when you talk about doing something, like say I want to work out, so I want to get in shape, and let's say I go, I need to like learn all about working out, I need to design a workout plan, I need to talk to people about working out. If I talk about doing something enough, I talk about what kind of diet I should be on, what my exercise schedule should be on, how I will vary my routine, how I'll make sure that I stay stretched out, and I talk to other people and ask them what they're doing. My brain will actually release a chemical in my mind, will release the same chemical as it releases when I actually do something. So we can talk about doing things and what should be done, and if we talk about it enough, our brain will actually, like, chemically release something telling us like, good job, you did it. And I never set foot on a treadmill. I didn't lift a weight. I didn't do anything. That's bonkers. So what that means is with all the stream of information, of all the things that we need to be outraged and burdened and concerned about, and we're talking about it, and we're writing posts about it, and can you believe this, and we're doing all this stuff, and we're not doing anything about it. And our brain is like, Good job, you did it, you did it. And we didn't do anything, we didn't do anything. We just got really anxious. And probably what happened is we got so anxious that we felt hurried and we felt busy and we just walked right over the guy in the alley that God actually had our path cross him so that we could engage in his mission to redeem the world right in front of us. We end up so busy and so hurried with so many things that we miss the kid at the locker, four lockers down from us every day, who's crying out for help. And we miss the neighbor across the street from us 
who's begging for a conversation or begging for somebody to come alongside them and invest in them. We miss the local issue that needs attending to because we're so concerned about what's going on in the Democratic Party or in the Republican Party, something that honestly, most of us are not gonna have one lick of influence on in our lifetime, but we miss the things right in front of us that we can have an influence on in our lives because we're so hurried and we're so busy that we're just like the people in that study. And we look at it and it's like, man, it's, there's something in us that feels like, like, but if I'm, if I'm, I'm gonna miss it. Like, there's so much, do you feel that? Like, there's so much brokenness in the world. And, and but here, let me just balance really quick. This is my one balancing statement. I'm not saying that we shouldn't know what's going on in the world. In fact, if you feel that, then either you haven't been around here a whole lot or, or maybe you haven't just heard us say it, but the bottom line is we care deeply about what's going on in the world, just like we care deeply about what's going on in our backyard. Um, but the point is for us to focus on what is engagement in God's mission for your life supposed to look like right now. And maybe that is something across the world. Awesome. Be obedient about that and take up that burden. But the bottom line is God isn't calling us to do all the things because what ends up happening is we try to do all the things or try to care about all the things and there's not enough of us to go around and we just end up, good job, you did something about it, but we didn't actually do anything about it. We chase all the things and we catch none of them rather than zeroing in on what is God's mission for your life right now? How is he asking you to join him right now in your world? And how can you be obedient to that? I was, um, I was reading a, uh, I was watching, a, I love football. I was watching a highlight reel of uh, football players. I love receivers. And back in the 70s, there was this guy, his name was Steve Largent. Steve Largent, when he was drafted, Nobody, people didn't even know if he was going to make the team. In fact, when he first got drafted by the, uh, the, the uh, Oilers, the Houston Oilers, uh, he ends up getting traded right away to the Seattle Seahawks. They didn't even want him. They traded him to, to Seattle, right? He was too small. He was too slow. I mean, he was faster than me, but for an NFL receiver, he was too slow, okay? He was not that good of a player. And people didn't even know if he would make a team. By the time he ended up retiring from a long and storied NFL career, he owned all the NFL's records for the most receptions in a season, for the most total receptions by any receiver all time. Um, I, like, he, he dominated the league as a receiver, and he was known as being not the biggest and not the fastest, but he had two things going for him. He was really smart, and then the other thing was he had really, really good hands. If the ball came anywhere close to him, he was catching the ball. And I watched an interview with him, and he said, he said this. He said, I actually used to not be that great at catching the ball. And then I had a shift in my mentality, and it changed everything for me as a receiver. He said, I used to catch the ball, and that didn't work. And so I stopped trying to catch the ball, and instead what I would do is I would focus on the most minuscule part of the ball that I could when I was watching it come towards me. And instead of trying to catch the ball, I would focus on the point of the ball, the smallest point of the ball coming towards me, and I would catch the point of the ball. And as I zeroed in my focus on a very small part of the ball, it actually helped me make more receptions and haul in more catches over the lifetime of my career. And I think we do that. We think to ourselves, like, I gotta do all the things and I gotta change the world for Jesus and then we don't do anything. And we feel like, but if I focus on the small thing, I'm gonna totally miss out on like the big thing that God has for me. It's like the small thing is the big thing. Zeroing in on the tip of the ball, that is catching the ball. That is faithfulness in what God is calling you to. And so I'm saying to you, what is it that God's calling you to to engage in his mission to redeem the world? What's that minuscule tip of the ball for you to focus on. I was on a team to El Salvador um, a couple weeks ago with, from our church, doing ministry with Jonathan um, and Alicia Ferrant and the ministry, you know, you guys know, if you've been around our church, um, we've been helping launch a, an orphanage for a few years now. And we were right there from the beginning. We helped buy the land for the orphanage. We've sent down work crews. We've helped furnish rooms. We've done all kinds of blood, sweat, tears, finances that we've put in there because there's, there's, there's a problem. There are all kinds of kids that need someone to love them. They're being abandoned. 
um, and they're losing their lives and they're being trafficked. And so um, it, right now it's stuck in bureaucratic gridlock and Jonathan and, and his team are trying to bust it loose. There aren't kids living there yet, but while um, they're waiting for, for permission from the government, um, they've been just putting all the administrative pieces in place. And while we were down there, Jonathan was sharing a story and he said, yeah, so we just hired uh, our caseworker. Our caseworker is the woman who's gonna, when we find out that there's a kid that's in danger of being trafficked or someone who had their relatives pass away, she will go out and, and, and do a case study. We'll meet with them. We'll find out what the need is. Do they actually need the orphanage? How can we rescue them? How can we care for them? How can we place them in the right home within the orphanage with the right leaders where they'll get the care that they need? All these kinds of things. And I said, well, where did you, where did you find her? Because she's in her mid-20s. Her name is Patty. And he said, this is a pretty cool story. He's like, her name is Patty. And we weren't sure who to get, and so we sent out where they live and where the orphanage is. It's this really small village. It's called Shutia. So like the tiniest village, okay? Nobody knows Shutia in El Salvador. It's like this dinky little place, right? And then El Salvador itself is this dinky little country the size of a postage stamp in Central America, right? And so Jonathan and Alicia have planted themselves and are doing ministry in this blip on a radar screen, this point of a football, Right? trying to be faithful. And he said, we weren't sure who to hire, and so we sent out word to some of our partner churches in these other little blips on the radar, these little villages. And we got this applicant, her name is Patty, and sat down to interview her. And we're interviewing her, and she's explaining her qualifications, and and she stopped and she said, I actually know you. And Jonathan was like, we've never never met before. And she goes, no, I, I know you. When I was six years old, you brought a team out into my village and you did a little kids program and somebody on that team gave me a stuffed animal and she said, it changed the trajectory of my life and I stayed involved with my church and as I got older, what you did with kids, I wanted to do with kids and so I've been running the kids ministry in my local little village church. I run the kids men. And now I'm hearing about this need for this orphanage and I want to do this for you. I, I'm qualified to do this. How awesome that what feels so inconsequential like a stuffed animal being given to a six-year-old girl in a super inconsequential village, inconsequential, in a super inconsequential country, that God can use all of that, as each person is faithful with what they're called to, God can use it to turn the world upside down. And what if we stopped chasing all of the things and we just went, God, what is it that you're calling, what does the tip of the football look like for me right now? Is it a conversation I need to have? Is it a way that I need to pray? Is it some place I need to start serving? Is it something I need to let go of and sacrifice? What is it that you're calling me to in my life. If we'll do that, God will turn the world upside down through us. He'll turn the world upside down through us. So, I want us to close this morning uh, in, with communion. And uh, if you haven't grabbed communion uh, in here, why don't you go ahead back to the baskets and grab communion. Hey, Campbell, Campbell, can you grab me some communion and bring it up? I forgot to grab some. Um, if you're at home or you're, you're tuning in online, grab whatever you have um, to represent the body and the blood of Christ. Um, something liquid, something solid, some bread, some juice. Um, that's all that you need. Um, it doesn't have to be bread and wine or bread and juice. Thanks, bud. Um, and here's what I want us to do. We're gonna, I want to read the scripture that we often read when we, when we celebrate communion. But I want you to listen to the wording because... Because what we celebrate in communion, what it means to follow Jesus, it is always, it's always a two-sided coin. It's always that we receive grace from God, but we also, grace from God goes through us to the rest of the world around us. There's always two sides of the coin. Um, which, by the way, we, we, just, we celebrate open communion. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you, we want you to take communion with us, even if you go to a different church, if you're comfortable with it. And if you're a, a, a kid or a teenager that's in this room, um, if you've never celebrated communion, talk to your parents or your grandparents um, to see if you're ready to, to celebrate communion. If you understand the body and the blood of Jesus, then we want you to, to participate. Um, but um, it's always two-sided. 
the grace of God comes to us, but then the intention of it is also for it to go through us to the rest of the world. And we see this even with communion. Communion is meant to celebrate God's goodness to us, but it's also meant to celebrate how his goodness goes through us. Listen to this verse, 1 Corinthians eleven, twenty-three. 23. It says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Listen to this last verse. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is receiving for ourselves the goodness of God, but our lives are meant to proclaim the good news of Jesus until he comes again to the world around us. And even taking communion, we thank God for his forgiveness and for his life that he's given to us through the, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we also put him on display that the rest of the world will know about him. We join him in engaging in the mission of God in the world. That's what we're called to as the people of God. So this morning, let's remember that. Let's take the bread together. And now let's take the cup. Let's pray. Lord, our desire is to not just receive from you, but our desire is to join you in what you're up to, that we be conduits of your goodness. So God, we pray right now that you would help us to focus in on the tip of the ball. What is it that you have for us, Lord? We... We want to engage with you. We don't want to be distracted by everything else around us. God, you might call us around the world. You might call us to advocate for something so much bigger than ourselves. If that's the case, make it clear to us. And Jesus, at the same time, you do call us to small things and to regular people and the needs right in front of us. And God, our desire is to faithfully serve you. If it's one person in our school, in our school God, speak that to us. If it's one of our clients, speak that to us. If it's one of our neighbors, speak that to us, Jesus. We don't want to be so hurried that we blow past it. So lead us, we pray, and give us everything good that we need in order to be used by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, he says we close here. You know, it's not enough for us to just go like, hey, you need to not be distracted so that you're, hurried and busy and then you're going to miss the mission and it's like okay but there has to be some practical engagement like how do I keep myself from being bombarded how do I how can I become savvy with my tech and that's why each week we've been giving you some super simple but super practical challenges to do for this week with the goal that you would take some of these challenges and turn them into kind of a digital rule that you'd pay attention to the, your engagement with media. You'd pay attention to your engagement with screens. And so the challenge is this week, and again, this week, try these out. And then, again, we're asking you, pray about making, like implementing some of these challenges from the week um, into your normal routine, the ones that you found meaningful. So the first one is to parent your phone. Um, parent your phone. That means you put it to bed before you go to bed and you get up before it gets up. And maybe you want to put it to bed in another room where you're not. You put it to sleep in its own room, and then you go lay down, you know, unwind a little bit like a parent would when they put their kids to bed, and then go to sleep. And then you wake up before them because you want a little bit of time before the kids get up to kind of gather yourself for the day, and then you wake them up. You would do the same thing with your phones. That's the first one. The second one is choose one day this week, no screens. You can do it. I believe it. I believe that you can do it. The world won't fall apart. I can't, I can't guarantee the world won't end on the day that you turn your phone off or don't have any screens, but I'd be willing. I'm not, I'm not a betting man, um, <laughs> but if I was, I'd be willing to bet that it's not going to fall apart. One day where you go, no screens today. I'm going to shut it off. I'm going to just live my life, whatever is tactile and in front of me. And the third thing, I was laughing about this. I, I, the, the second one um, where I said, like shut your phone off. Apparently there was a kid, I had a parent come up to me after first service and they're like, my son was like, that's easy. I can do that a day without my phone. And she goes, no, no, no. That would mean your DS, your tablet, 
your computer, your television, and started listing all the things, not just your phone. And the kid was like, oh, I thought you just meant my phone. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, no screens where you get rid of all of it, okay? Uh, the third one is to commit to using screens for a purpose rather than aimlessly. So again, we're not gonna just get it out because we wanna see what the world is up to on Instagram or on TikTok, but we're gonna get it out because like, well, I need to call my sister, so I'll pull my phone out. I need to find a recipe for dinner tonight. I need to, you know, I, I'm not getting notifications ever, like all throughout the day. I have them on do not disturb and then I have alarms set for four times throughout the day and this is one of my alarms so I'm gonna get my phone out to check my messages during this time. That kind of living purposefully rather than aimlessly with our technology, that's the challenge and then to implement it into a longer term digital rule of life for yourself. So I've gone really long. I appreciate you guys hanging with me this morning. Uh, thank you so much. Love you guys. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you back here next week.